Government External Affairs. Question number one from Colin Smith. To ask the Scottish Government what representations it made to the Queen's and Lord Treasurer's Remembrance and National Museum Scotland regarding the acquisition and display of the Galloway Viking Hoard. Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislop. Uh, the allocation of items under the Treasure Trove Code of Practice operates entirely independently of Ministers and the Scottish Government and it is inappropriate for Ministers to interfere or make representation to the Queen's and Lord Treasurer's Remembrancer regarding allocations. I have uh, strongly encouraged both the National Museum Scotland and the Fraser Gallery Council to reach agreement on a partnership securing the long-term future of the hoard and access it to it uh, both for the public in Galloway uh, on a long-term basis and for wider on audiences in Scotland. I have proposed a summit for all parties involved and look forward to progressing the significant opportunities for this collection of international significance. Colin Smith. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. She will be aware of the, the deep disappointment in Dumfries and Galloway at the decision to allocate the, the Viking Horde to National Museums Scotland. And although the Cabinet Secretary makes reference to the proposals from NMS to lend a portion of the Horde to Dumfries and Galloway Council for display at Kirkcubri Art Gallery, she will know that to date that offer is still very vague. It will mean the full Horde will only ever be displayed in Dumfries and Galloway when NMS do not require it in Edinburgh. There are no details of how long and how far apart these loans might be. It is unclear what NMS mean by displaying an undefined quote significant and representative proportion of the Horde outside these periods is. And there does not appear to be any real opportunity for the Council to derive additional income from the commercial exploitation of the Horde to offset the cost of transport and what will be valuable items to and from Edinburgh. So will the Cabinet Secretary ensure that the summit she proposes will uh, ensure there is a, a proposal that is not just dictated by NMS but meets the aspirations of Dumfries and Galloway Council and the local community for a permanent world-class exhibition of the Galloway Horde at Kirkcubri Art Gallery? Cabinet Secretary. I understand the local disappointment in the Friesland Gallery, but I'm determined that we have an opportunity to make sure that the Galway region does benefit from the display of the hoard. Uh, I think, indeed, the big, most immediate challenge is actually to raise the £2 million uh, to secure the hoard uh, for, for the public and also uh, the £300,000 for the conservation. Uh, as we speak, I understand that officials, both from National Museums uh, of Scotland and the Council are working together to put forward a joint proposal of what could make, what could make the, the, the most opportunity uh, for the display. And I, I, I think a significant long-term permanent display um, of a significant proportion of the hoard um, is something that I think can be achieved. But we also have to recognise the, the, the requirements for the rest of Scotland to have the opportunity to see it as well. So I think there is an opportunity for a way forward. That's why I move very swiftly um, to establish mm -hmm. A summit, and I'm looking forward to hearing uh, that joint presentation from both the, the local council, but also from National Museums of Scotland. Finlay Carson, uh, the decision taken to award the Galloway Viking Hoard to the National Museum of Scotland must not mean that the hoard is lost to Edinburgh. It is vital that we see a large proportion of the hoard return to Galloway, and I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her response to my letter last week, in which she set out the details of the summit to discuss a partnership between Dumfries and Galloway Council and NMS, and I look forward to receiving further details of it. Bringing the hoard back to the area on a long-term, secure basis would bring a great amount of excitement, add to tourism levels, and boost the economy and cultural prosperity of the region. What assurances can the Cabinet Secretary give to my constituents that she will do all she can do to ensure that the area will enjoy the full range of economic and cultural benefits associated with this significant find? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I am personally very committed to supporting the visitor attraction opportunities in the south of Scotland. Uh, it's part of our manifesto commitment and our programme for government. And in relation to the Horde, I think there are great opportunities uh, that we can be, can, can, can be uh, achieved from the Horde. Of course, the preservation and conservation has to take place itself in order to determine how it can be displayed. Uh, but I am committed, uh, and you can have my reassurances, that I do want to make sure that there um, is opportunity for uh, the Galloway region. And uh, he might want to add congratulations that we've also managed to secure Monarch of the Glen for tours to the Kukubri Galleries. And I hope that gives you some commitment and understanding of, of my desire to make sure the national collections of Scotland are uh, exhibited across the nation of Scotland. Question number two, Colin Beatty. To ask the Scottish Government what recent steps it's taken to promote culture and tourism in Midlothian and East Lothian. 
Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the Scottish Government provides ongoing financial support for the National Mining Museum in Midlothian and the National Museum of Flight, part of National Museum Scotland in East Lothian, both of which are key cultural attractions. As with all areas of Scotland, the fantastic assets of Midlothian and East Lothian are marketed by Visit Scotland using marketing campaigns, social media, trade and press familiarisation trips through the eye centres, through information partner programmes and local businesses and community groups. Visit Scotland visitor guides and dedicated regional microsites feature attractions and activities in Mid Midlothian and East Lothian, whilst wider Visit Scotland campaigns feature the area as part of uh, themes around food and drink, for example. Uh, two 2017 Year of History, Heritage and Archaeology partner programme events have taken place in Midlothian to date, and two have already taken place in East Lothian, with another two scheduled to follow in September. Colin Beattie. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her response. Would she agree with me that cultural events such as Musselburgh's Riding of the Marches, the Midstock Music Festival in Dalkeith Country Park, and the more recent return of the historic Dalkeith Station Bell to Dalkeith Museum all help to provide substantial financial and cultural benefits to my constituency? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I, I do indeed, and I think if you look at the recent stats on why people visit the Lothians, uh, scenery and landscape account for 60%, but the history and culture count for another 53%. So there's two aspects here. One, we want to make sure that our country is open and welcoming to our visitors, so therefore anything in Brexit that would consider visas for, for visitors would be detrimental. Uh, but probably as importantly and more immediately is the issue around those uh, EU nationals that help support our tourism and culture industries and 10% of the tourism industry is supported in employment uh, by EU nationals and that's something that I think is an imperative uh, for the negotiations uh, as they're due to start on the 19th of June um, to, to establish the, the, you know, the, the, the importance and the recognition of the status of the EU nationals that are living and contributing to our economy including tourism and including to the members constituency. Michelle Ballantyne. Thank you for signing off sir. Sustainable tourism has been given a huge boost in East Lothian with the announcement of a proposed £5.5 million National Marine Centre in North Berwick. This development should be commended. Can I ask what plans the Scottish Government has to support this project? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I had the, the pleasure of visiting um, the Seabird Centre in North Berwick only a few weeks ago. I was shown the extensive and ambitious plans. I think in particular the opportunity for education uh, was, was, was very strongly uh, evident in the plans. Uh, there are no formal approaches as yet in terms of um, the, 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 the taking the project forward. They have very ambitious fundraising uh, activity, but obviously they want to make sure that they're, they're equipped and uh, have that established before they might contact as ourselves on that matter but I, I think uh, the, the the quality of that provision it's a, a fantastic tourism uh, project I think it showed uh, vision at the outset to be established and I think it's a very good example to the rest of Scotland what vision and ambition can do in terms of visitor attraction question number three Stuart McMillan thank you presiding officer to ask the Scottish Government how National Gallery Scotland helps to promote culture and tourism in Inverclyde cabinet secretary by the National Galleries of Scotland at present, they have no active partnerships in Inverclyde. However, the National Galleries are always willing to consider proposals and suggestions from any region across Scotland. National Galleries of Scotland presently has partnerships with Dunoon, uh, Clydebank and Campaisley in the neighbouring areas, but not currently in Inverclyde. Stuart McMillan. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that reply. On, on the 25th of May, the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Relations Committee, of which I'm a member, held an evidence session with senior representatives from the various national galleries, uh, gallery bodies from Scotland. And there was that acceptance that the partnership working, taking some of the national works to local communities, can have the positive effect both culturally and also for the tourism offering. Does the Cabinet Secretary welcome this partnership approach? Uh, which you welcome this approach taking place in Inverclyde and that you consider cultural tourism to be of great benefit to the local economy in Inverclyde. Cabinet Secretary. I think uh, cultural tourism is important to all parts of Scotland and I'm keen to see how it can be explored further in Inverclyde. I know, for example, already the National Museums of Scotland um, have a relationship with Inver in Inverclyde and particularly the Maclean uh, uh, Gallery and Museum and I understand when it becomes uh, open again after refurbishment, they want to continue that partnership. Uh, I heard only this morning when I was in Inverness about the partnership they have with the National Galleries of Scotland and as I've just said in a previous answer, um, the Scottish Government has supported 
the, uh, the touring of Monarch of the Glen, which is going to four different parts of Scotland, uh, not to Inverclyde as yet. Uh, the Paisley, I think, is the nearest location for that. But I do think that uh, opportunities <coughs> to, to embrace um, partnerships from our national collections with different parts of the country uh, should be welcomed. And I will draw the attention of the National Galleries of Scotland to your interest, particularly um, um, uh, Stuart McMillan, to, to Inverclyde and your constituency. And Jamie Green. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, may I echo the comments by Stuart McMillan that if there are opportunities to bring uh, art to Inverclyde, it would be very welcome. Additionally, I note that the National Galleries of Scotland are digitising their 94,000 piece collection. Can I ask uh, the Cabinet Secretary uh, what the Scottish Government is doing to encourage other galleries and museums to reach the widest possible uh, audience through the use of technology and online? Well, only this morning when I was in Inverness at the Expo North uh, uh, festival, I, I chaired a session which was precisely about how different museums and galleries across Scotland can engage with uh, digitisation and other technologies. Uh, and one of the strong messages from that is not just a case of um, you know, delivering predetermined pre digitisation of collections, but the involvement and participation of local communities in the type of uh, te te technology and the type of digitised uh, materials is really important in the curation of any exhibitions locally. So the, the local engagement is as important as a facility of it but we are very uh, very lucky and, and very blessed that with the collections that we have and indeed um, the National Galleries of Scotland have got an extensive digitisation programme uh, and that brings a whole new a whole new area of opportunity uh, for participation in the national cultural life of Scotland. Question number four Elaine Smith. Thank you to ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to strengthen relations between Scotland and Cuba. Minister Alistair Allen. We do not have any plans at present to develop uh, further links with Cuba. However, we are always willing to consider opportunities as they arise uh, where these support the government's broader priorities. Elaine Smith. Well, I thank the Minister for that response. And in that case, is the Minister aware that in Cuba, life expectancy for men is 79 years, in Glasgow it's 73. Cuba has one GP for every 884 people. In Scotland, it's one for 1,083. Cuba provides free school meals for all children. In Scotland, it's only P1 to P3, and Cuba is recognised as having world-leading education, while Scotland just recorded its worst ever performance in the international PISA ranking. So, given Scotland's increasing crisis in health and falling standards in schools, and Cuba's world-renowned excellence in education and health, will the Minister consider what lessons could be learned from Cuba? Minister. Well, without accepting too many of the many premises uh, behind that question, uh, I can say that uh, the, at a UK level, indeed, the, since the UK has uh, diplomatic relations with the world, the UK uh, has uh, indeed uh, uh, taken some steps forward in its uh, relationship um, with Cuba in recent years. Uh, there has been uh, a formal declaration between the UK and Cuba signed uh, on the 5th of July 2011, which has strengthened many of the relationships that we have. Uh, indeed, our, our uh, relationship that we have with, with Cuba and other countries means we can have full and frank discussions about all uh, these and many other issues. Um, but uh, as I say, at the moment, uh, such formal relations do not exist. Question five, Richard Lyle. Thank you, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what discussions it is having with UK government agencies regarding bringing major events to Scotland. Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislop. Uh, through bodies including Events Scotland and Sports Scotland, the Scottish Government works closely with UK government agencies such as UK Sport and with the devolved administrations to help deliver the ambitions set out in the national event strategies, Scotland the perfect stage. This includes projects such as the forthcoming Total World Badminton Championships being held at the Emirates Arena in Glasgow in August this year, European Gymnastic Championships taking place as part of the Glasgow 2018 European Championships in August 2018 and the European Short course swimming at Tollcross Pool in 2019. Richard Lyle. Can I thank the uh, Cabinet Secretary for her answer? The Cabinet Secretary has made reference to a number of successful events Scotland has hosted. We know that Scotland has a record in successfully delivering major do domestic or international events. I therefore wish to ask the Cabinet Secretary what role she considers the UK Government to have in its responsibilities to help promote Scotland on the international stage and what actions the Scottish Government undertake regularly to promote Scotland as an attractive place 
to host major events. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, uh, Scotland's reputation, both as a welcoming nation, but also in uh, delivering and competently delivering major events, is, is a gathering uh, international reputation. As we go forward, we want to exploit that and, uh, and use our experience. So we are continuously trying to attract major events. Some of them might be major associations or business conferences or uh, conventions. Some of it might be sports. Uh, we need to continue, obviously, working with the UK in terms of their international reach in their networks, but our reputation as a welcoming nation and our reputation as being a country of first choice to do business with is very, very important. And as we go forward, and particularly through the Brexit uh, positioning, it is vitally important that the UK and its networks uh, make sure that they do not undermine that in any way, because Scotland is progressing and advancing on our event strategy. We're ambitious, we're working with partners to do that, and we want that to continue. Question six, Richard Leonard. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what issues were discussed during its recent meeting with the Ambassador of Israel to the United Kingdom. Cabinet Secretary. Our discussions included Scotland's relationship with Israel, the Israel-Palestine conflict and uh, issues relating to the Jewish community in Scotland. I expressed the Scottish Government's concerns about the continued construction of Israeli settlements on occupied Palestinian land and the restrictions on Gaza. I also raised a number of issues that have been brought to my attention through ministerial and constituency correspondence, such as the rights of Christians, the restrictions on the gathering of the olive harvest in Palestine and other limitations in freedom of movement and other rights. The Scottish Government will continue to encourage Israel and Palestine to work together to achieve a negotiated two-state solution to the conflict that respects the rights of all communities. Richard Leonard. Can I thank the uh, Cabinet Secretary for her response? Uh, in view of the Scottish Government's Open Government Partnership Scottish National Action Plan, in which the First Minister claims that she wants, and I quote, an outward-looking government which is more open and accessible to Scotland's people than ever before, Will the Cabinet Secretary now publish the agenda and minutes of her meeting with the Ambassador of Israel on the 18th of May this year? And for the same reasons of openness and transparency, will she publish any preceding or subsequent related correspondence? Cabinet Secretary. I think I was fairly open and transparent in my answer as to what exactly was discussed at that meeting. But the member has to res uh, re respect and reflect that in relation to our discussions with uh, ministers or indeed ambassadors from other countries, we've got to respect the space that they have, the diplomatic space, to share their views with us and us with them. So in terms of uh, our treatment of that, we will respect that. Uh, but I have been quite clear in my openness, because uh, I know that the, the interest in the, this issue, I have been quite clear in terms of the agenda and the content of that discussion, which I've just relayed to you in my initial question. Question seven, Adam Tomkin. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it supports the Scottish Event Campus to increase business tourism in Glasgow. Cabinet Secretary. It recognises that business events are an excellent means to showcase Scotland as a place to invest, study, live, work and visit, as well as delivering direct economic impact through delegate expenditure to business events. It also gives us an excellent platform to work with organisers to de demonstrate Scotland's strength and innovation in our key sectors, especially linkages to further and higher education. Uh, visit Scotland business events uh, continue to encourage at the highest level uh, strategic partnership working uh, with clients that keep Scotland um, and also gateway destinations such as Glasgow and Scotland's largest venue, the SEC, at the heart of the global business events industry. And Scottish Enterprise have been working with Scottish Event Campus since May 2015 around any future support for this development. Uh, there are a number of events uh, that, that are held that are supported by the Scottish Government, including the Visit Scotland Expo held in the SEC in 2013, 14 and 17. And there's a whole variety of other events which I'll not go into at this stage. Adam Jopkins. Uh, th thank you, and I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Some £411 million is spent in the Glasgow economy every year as a result of the conferences, concerts, exhibitions and events held at the SEC. In 2014, the opening of the Hydro boosted the SEC's concert business, and similar investment is now required at the west end of the SEC site to make a comparable con uh, contribution to boosting the SEC's uh, exhibition business. What assistance can the Scottish Government offer to make this investment a reality an investment that would pay for itself in terms of the additional GVA in Glasgow's economy that it would trigger. Cabinet Secretary. 
Um, I, I understand that uh, that expansion, which is integral, to, I think, to the development of uh, the tourist opportunities uh, in Glasgow, was not part of the original Glasgow City deal. He may want to make representations uh, also to the UK government as, as part of that. Uh, but in terms of my discussions, I have met with the SEC to hear about their plans. Only last week, I met with Bridget McConnell, who is the chair of Glasgow Life, who now have the tourism uh, responsibilities uh, for Glasgow. So I have got a keen interest in this. In terms of our, our budgets and opportunities, uh, he'll be aware that the restrictions and limitations that are there. But I, I do think that we have to think big and we have to think ambitious, ambitiously about what is next for Scotland. We had a question about events. Bearing in mind, we have had the Ryder Cup, we have had the Commonwealth Games. Seeking future events um, and different conventions to come to the city may mean that we may need to look at a bit more wider and to engage on a long-term basis. So I am very interested in the project, but I can't give you any detail at this stage, but I, it is something that I'm actively interested in. Thank you. And that concludes our questions on culture, tourism and external affairs. We turn now to questions for justice and the law officers. Question number one, Linda Fabiani. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what recourse there is for people who are dissatisfied with the Police Investigations and Review Commissioner's response to a complaint. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. Any complaint about the service provided or about a member of the Police Investigations and Review Commissioner's staff should initially be directed to them as they have their own complaint handling process. If a complainer remains dissatisfied, then they can contact the Scottish Public Services Ombudsman, who is responsible for considering complaints about organisations providing public services in Scotland. Linda Fabiani. Yeah, can, I, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer and say that I do have concerns that have come from a couple of constituency cases that perhaps the PERC service isn't working as well as it should in terms of the relationship between the complainant, uh, the police service about whom the complaint was, and the way that it's dealt with and indeed followed up by PERC. And can I ask the Cabinet Secretary that if I put some of these concerns in writing, he'll give them some consideration and perhaps raise them at his next meeting with the appropriate Commissioner. Cabinet Secretary. Epstein officer, if the member wishes to write to me with some of the details on these matters, I can ensure that the uh, Commissioner gives these her uh, consideration. Last week I visited the PERC and met with a range of the staff who are responsible for conducting these investigations, whether it be into uh, complaints which have been uh, already investigated by the police and are being reviewed by the PERC, or whether it be cases that have been referred directly uh, to the PERC by the Crown Office. And I know that the staff there uh, give a, a tremendous amount of thought on how they can make sure that these cases are managed as effectively uh, as possible, including engaging with those who are the complainers and uh, how they are taking these matters uh, forward. And I know that the uh, Commissioner is also very keen to make sure that the service that uh, individuals uh, receive from the PERC is of the very highest uh, standard. But I'm uh, very conscious that the Member has raised a number of issues relating to this uh, in the past couple of years. Uh, relating to constituents. One of them was in relation to the uh, way in which uh, data protection matters were being taken forward, an issue which was picked up on by the Her Majesty Inspector of Constabulary in Scotland when looking at the carrying out an assurance review of the counter corruption unit. And as a result of that, Police Scotland have now worked with the uh, criminal allegations against the Police Service Division uh, of the Crown Office to introduce a new process for considering data protection cases which involve police officers which expedites that process and makes it uh, much quicker. But if the member wants to set more of these issues out in writing to me, uh, I'll ensure that she receives a full response from the Commissioner. Oliver Mundell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I've too had a number of constituents raise concerns uh, about some aspects of PERC's uh, work. In that context, I wonder if I could ask the Cabinet Secretary what consideration he's given to expanding the remit of PERC to allow them to investigate complaints made by serving police officers about other police officers. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary. Well, Sine Officer, there is a process within uh, the police service for uh, handling complaints being made uh, by uh, serving police officers against uh, an existing serving police officer. Uh, one of the areas of work that was uh, taken forward as a result of the assurance review by HMICS uh, is in relation to the counter-corruption unit, which uh, Police Scotland are now changing, uh, which is taking 
for the range of uh, different measures in order to improve, improve the way in which it operates. And in this instance, for this constituent, that may be uh, the appropriate route in which for it to be uh, uh, considered. However, at this present stage, there are no plans to extend the role of PERC into investigating complaints between uh, police officers while they are still in service. Uh, but if the member has some specific issues that he wishes to raise with me, I'd be more than happy to make sure those issues are appropriately considered by either Police Scotland or the PERC. Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer. Given that I have also been assisting a constituent with an ongoing similar situation for many years, and I have approached Chief Constables, PIC, SPA, COPFS, PDS, CAAPD, the Justice Committee, Law Officers and various Cabinet Secretaries over the years, will the Cabinet Secretary agree to listen now to the genuine concerns of officers who have got nowhere else to turn and will he look specifically at my constituent's case? Cabinet Secretary. Well, President Officer, I, I can't comment directly on individual cases and where it's a matter that relates to operational issues, that's a matter for the Chief Constable and the processes which are set out uh, within, uh, uh, within uh, the, policing, uh, uh, the, policing process, the police process for dealing uh, with these issues. Ministers do not have uh, a direct role in investigating these types of issues. I'm mindful of the fact that the uh, member has raised it with a range of different parties uh, through the Scottish Parliament and uh, with uh, the Scottish Parliament. However, uh, if the member wants to write to me uh, setting out uh, these issues, I'd be more than happy to refer it on to the appropriate body for considering these issues. But ministers do not have uh, a responsibility in investigating these individual cases uh, directly themselves. Question number two, David Torrance. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how much Police Scotland and Scottish Fire and Rescue Service have paid in back that they have not been able to claim back. Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, also the amount of unrecovered VAT incurred by the Scottish Police Authority and the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service between April 2013 and March 2017 is of the order of £140 million. We will continue to press UK ministers over this disparity, which could see a cost to the Scottish uh, public purse of £280 million by the end of the current parliamentary session 2020-21. David Torrance. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that as the UK Government have changed rules to enable academy schools and Highway England to reclaim that, that it is rep reprehensible that they refuse to make the same change for vital emergency services in Scotland, which would bring them into line with emergency services in other parts of the UK? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, officer, I wholeheartedly agree with uh, David Torrance and his uh, comments on this matter. The UK Government could very easily uh, change the rules to enable Police Scotland and the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service to recover VAT. Uh, the UK Government uh, has shown that where there is a political will, uh, the VAT Act can be amended to permit new bodies to recover VAT. The member made reference to them. Since uh, Police Scotland have been created and the Scottish Fire and Rescue have been created, a range of bodies have been included in the VAT Act, which allows them to recover VAT, including Health Education England, the Health Research Authority, the Strategic Highway Companies, Highway England, the London Legacy Development Corporation, and Academy Schools. Then, officer, if it's good enough for all of these organisations, in my view, it's good enough for Scotland's emergency services. Question three, Peter Chapman. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the increase in reported sexual offences in 2016-2017. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government will publish the validated figures for recorded crime in September. The increase in sexual crimes implied by Police Scotland's recent report represents a continuation of a long-term trend, similar to that seen across the rest of the UK. The full reasons for the growth in recorded sexual crime are complex, but increasing historical and online cases are part of the picture. Scottish Government an and analysts working with Police Scotland are undertaking a study of crime recording to gain a better understanding of sexual offending in Scotland. The results will inform how the justice system and wider public services respond to these incidents, and we will publish this in September. But for today, we want those who are victims of sexual crimes and sexual offences to be able to come forward and report in confidence and in the knowledge that a responsive justice system will help to ensure access to justice for the victim. 
In addition to the specially trained officers who work within Police Scotland's National Rape Task Force and highly trained prosecutors in the National Sexual Crimes Unit, we understand victims need specialist support, and that's why we've invested record levels of funding in third sector organisations. Peter Chapman. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Uh, Police Scotland has reported that there has been an increase in the number of 16 to 24 year olds rape victims who had met the suspect online and also pointed, pointed to an exponential rise in cyber enabled sexual crime in the last decade. What is the Scottish Government doing to promote safety online, particularly amongst children and young people? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, so, also, the member raises a, a very important issue because, as I mentioned, the analytical work that's been carried out just now has already indicated that some of that increase that we've saw in sexual offences has been driven by, uh, uh, by uh, cyber-related crime and online-related uh, crime. And that's exactly why Police Scotland are taking forward the 2026 strategy to look at how they can get the balance of expertise within the organisation much more reflective of that new and emerging type of crime. So, for example, those where it is relating to cyber-related crime, is that they have the expertise within the organisation to support the police and be able to deal with that much more effectively. But the member should also be aware that there has been a gradual increase in sexual crime over uh, the last uh, decade. That's not peculiar to Scotland. Uh, that is reflected across the UK and, to some degree, across uh, Western Europe. And what the analysis that we're carrying out just now will assist us in doing is to make sure that we've got a much sharper focus on where the increases are taking place and to then make sure that we're taking forward appropriate measures in order to try and prevent these crimes from occurring. And as it stands at the present moment, Police Scotland have a programme which they run in partnerships with their education authorities to help to make sure that young people have an understanding and awareness of the risks associated with uh, online activity and that work will continue and once we've had this analysis we can look at what further work can be done in order to help to make sure that we prevent these crimes from occurring in the first place. Claire Baker. Uh, thank you, President Officer. While I recognise the Cabinet Secretary has outlined that validated figures will be published in September, the figures that were published last week did also show that domestic abuse had increased from uh, 57,702 cases to over um, 58,500. But the detection rate fell from around 81.2% to 74.1%. So can the Cabinet Secretary outline what he thinks the factors behind these figures are? Cabinet Secretary. In relation to domestic abuse, um, the, uh, one of the reasons that we're seeing an increase, uh, we believe we're seeing an increase, is uh, an increase in confidence in reporting these matters, uh, but also the way in which they're now being investigated by Police Scotland. Uh, so, for example, the way in which they now investigate them is that when an individual makes a complaint is that they're also looking for previous partners relating to that particular individual the allegations being made against which results in, in some cases, uh, where an initial complaint comes from one individual, in some cases it can involve two or three individuals that then make complaints against a, a perpetrator. That has resulted in an increasing demand being made on our Crown uh, Office and Procurator Fiscal Service in dealing with these cases, which is why we put additional investment into the court service this year to help to support them in dealing with uh, cases relating to domestic uh, violence. So that growing confidence and the changing nature of the way in which they're now being investigated has resulted in an increasing number of uh, cases being reported and recorded. But what we need to do is to make sure that we are supporting the organisations that work with women who experience domestic violence, which is why we are providing record levels of funding to these organisations, and at the same time making sure that our law is fit for purpose. And that's why we also have a domestic abuse bill before the Parliament in order to look at how we can much more effectively deal with all forms of domestic abuse, not just the physical abuse, but also the psychological abuse that can often be associated with it. Question number four, Jackie Bailey. To ask the Scottish Government whether it has confidence in the chairperson of the Scottish Police Authority. Cabinet Secretary. As the member is aware uh, from the answer I gave to Parliament on the 30th of May, we will give thorough consideration to the issues set out in the recent reports received from the Justice Subcommittee on Policing and the Public Audit and post legislative Scrutiny Committee in coming to a determination. Jackie Bailey. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response? And I recognise that it was the Cabinet Secretary that appointed Mr Flanagan to his current position. So I appreciate his frustration that Mr Flanagan has not been successful in his role as chair of the SPA. And whilst I urge him to take action 
to restore trust in the Scottish Police Authority, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what lessons have been learnt about the role and responsibilities of board members and whether this has led to any change in approach by the Scottish Government? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, officer, uh, the member will also recognise that in uh, evidence to the Public Audit Committee, uh, Committee HMICS also set out the uh, improvements which have been made in the SPA over the course of the last two years uh, in the way in which it scrutinises issues such as C3, uh, in the way in it's also looked at issues around stop and search, in the way in which it has now engaged with Police Scotland in a much more constructive fashion. So I think it's wrong to characterise the fact that there have not been changes and improvements over the course of the last two years. Notwithstanding that, uh, Andrew Flanagan set out the areas where he's also accepted that he has not uh, uh, he has, uh, uh, he has not uh, uh, met the levels which have been expected uh, of him. And what I can assure the member is that we will give con careful consideration to the findings, both from the Public Audit Committee and also from the uh, Subcommittee on Policing, and we will set out in due course what measures we will put in place to address these matters. George Adam. Thank you, President Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary tell me when we can expect HMICS's report to report on the uh, Scottish Police Authority's governance review? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Officer, Her Majesty's Inspector of Constabulary for Scotland uh, were asked to bring forward their uh, review aspect of the SPA to look specifically at governance uh, as a result of some of the concerns which were raised by the Public Audit Committee, something which the Acting Convener in a letter to me welcomed uh, and believed was an appropriate measure uh, to be taken given the concerns that have been raised by uh, the Committee and I welcomed their endorsement in taking that action uh, forward. HMICS uh, has agreed uh, that they intend to uh, publish a report uh, hopefully by the 22nd of June. Question number five, Annie Wells. Thank you, President Officer to ask the Scottish Government whether it would provide an update on its work to prevent violent crime. Minister Annabel Ewing. Uh, the member will be aware that crime is at a 42-year low, uh, while the number of homicides and crimes of handling an offensive weapon are at their lowest since records began. However, we recognise that there is still more to do. Violence is a complex issue, and as such, we need to tackle the causes, not just the symptoms. That is why our strategy is focused on tough enforcement, coupled with education and diversion activity. We continue to put significant investment into the National Violence Reduction Unit, which aims to reduce violent crime and behaviour by working with partner agencies to achieve long-term societal and attitudinal change, as well as by focusing on enforcement. Annie Wells. Thank you for that answer. We know that knife crime is a significant problem in some communities in Glasgow. What update can the Scottish Government give on action it is taking to educate young people about the dangers of carrying a knife? Minister. Uh, Yes, thank you. I, I can say to, to the member that we also continue to invest in a range of other initiatives such as the excellent No Knives, Better Lives uh, initiative. Uh, this has now been made available to all local authority areas in Scotland and it does indeed educate young people about the dangers and the consequences associated with carrying uh, a knife and encourages positive life choices away from violence. I would also add that uh, in addition to the uh, many other initiatives, one particularly pertinent uh, one I think I should mention here further to the member's question is the Medics Against Violence uh, Secondary School Programme. Uh, and, and this involves uh, some uh, 250 volunteer medics from Glasgow having pledged their time to help uh, uh, educate young people by going into schools and explaining the consequences of, of violence, particularly uh, of knife uh, crime violence. Uh, and that has been a very successful programme. And I would commend all of the medics who have given up their time uh, to do that. Mary Fee. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Minister will be aware that serious assault crimes recorded between 2014-15 and 2016-17 increased by almost a third, and figures from the SPA show that murders have increased by 30%. What specific action is the Government taking to tackle these rises in the most violent of crimes? Will the Scottish Government invest in more community policing, policing? and can the Minister give us any further information on the di diversionary initiative she um, responded to Annie Wells' initial, initial question. Minister. Uh, yes, I mean, I would say that the overall trend in terms of, for example, homicide is, is indeed uh, uh, going down. And we see also in terms of non-sexual crimes of violence that there's been a reduction uh, of uh, some 51% since 2006-2007. Uh, uh, so I hope that the member takes some uh, heart from that. Uh, in addition to the, the initiatives I've already mentioned in response to the 
the, the question from Annie Wells, uh, there is uh, uh, also, uh, for example, the Mentors in Violence Prevention Programme. Uh, and this encourages young people to understand various forms of violence and to be leaders in supporting each other in that any form of, of violence or abuse towards another is unaccepted and will not be tolerated. Uh, this uh, uh, programme uh, involves a total of 108 schools across 18 local authorities which are currently engaging in the MVP programme. Uh, work indeed is now being undertaken with Education Scotland to accelerate the expansion uh, to reach an additional 30,000 young people in an additional 93 uh, secondary schools across Scotland by March uh, 2018. So that initiative, together with the work of community-based officers, to which the member referred, uh, and uh, the Navigator programme, which uh, is a feature of the Glasgow Royal Infirmary uh, Accident and Emergency Department and has been extended now to the Edinburgh Royal Infirmary uh, Department, to the Ask Support Care uh, 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 campaign which involves the violence reduction unit along with medics against violence to train uh, professionals who interact with uh, women in, in many aspects of their lives to spot signs particularly of domestic abuse these are a whole range of initiatives uh, that we are currently engaging in uh, and I hope the member would feel that we are doing everything we can to, to tackle uh, violent crime thank you minister that brings us to an end of portfolio questions the next item of business is consideration of business motion 5998 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Bureau setting out a business programme. I would ask any member to indicate now if they wish to speak against the motion. I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move the motion. Formally moved. Thank you very much. And no one has asked to speak against the motion. The question therefore is that we agree motion 5998. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. Next item is consideration of business motion 5999 also in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Bureau setting out a timetable at stage two of the Child Poverty Bill. I would ask any member to indicate now if they wish to speak against the motion. I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move the motion. Moved. Thank you very much. No one wishes to speak against it. The question therefore is that we agree motion 5999. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And the next item of business is consideration of two parliamentary bureau motions. I'd ask Joe Fitzpatrick to move motions 6000 and 6001 on the approval of SSIs. Moved. Thank you. So we now come to decision time, and the first question is that motion 6000 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on approval of an SSI be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And the final question is that motion 6001 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on approval of an SSI be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. That concludes decision time. And I now close this meeting.